Good afternoon, everyone. We're so glad that you've joined us for today's session, Policymaking for Fair Labor Practices, Equitable Enforcement and Worker Rights to Support Healthy Families. My name is Shani Wusu, and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Change Lab Solutions. Before we dive into today's topic, I wanted to take a moment and welcome you all and briefly introduce you to Change Lab. We are a nonpartisan nonprofit organization that uses the tools of law and policy to advance health equity. We partner with communities across the nation to improve health and opportunity by changing harmful laws, policies, and systems. Our interdisciplinary team works with community organizations, all levels of government, and local institutions to design and implement equitable and practical policy solutions to complex challenges. We believe that laws and policies that have perpetuated racism, discrimination, and segregation throughout our nation's history have had and continue to have a profound effect on health and well being. Our work focuses on addressing what we call the fundamental drivers of health inequity. Those are structural discrimination and racism, income inequality, disparities in opportunity, disparities in political power, and governance that limits meaningful participation. We outline this framework in our blueprint for change makers, which is available on our website for anyone who's interested in diving deeper. Today's session is the second of our four part equity in action series. Throughout the series, we've been exploring strategies to address these drivers by focusing on a specific issue area and hearing from folks representing diverse sectors. Some of you may have joined us last month when we kicked off the series with a conversation about housing justice and discussed equity considerations when it comes to housing code enforcement. In the coming months, we'll also explore policymaking in rural communities and the important role that public health authority and the public health workforce plays in supporting equitable health outcomes. But today, we're here to talk about fair labor practices. And the theme of equitable policy enforcement, which was discussed last month during the housing code conversation, will be just as relevant today um, in our discussion. We have a great panel with us today. So with that, thank you again for being here with us. And I'll pass it to my colleague, Holly Mugjosh, to get the conversation started. Holly. Thank you so much, Shaniqua. First, I just wanna take a moment to go over some logistical notes for today. We are recording this event and it will be posted on the Change Lab Solutions website. You'll receive an email with a link to the recording once it's ready. If you have questions for our panelists throughout today's discussion, please submit them through the Q&A box. My colleague, Maya Hazarika Watts, will be monitoring incoming questions and we'll have some time at the end to address them. The chat function for this webinar is also open. We invite you to share comments or reactions along the way and to engage with your fellow attendees. And finally, we'll be live tweeting during this session and we invite you to join us on social media using the hashtag policymaking for equity. I also wanna let everyone know that closed captioning is available for today's session. In your Zoom window, you should see a button that says show captions pictured here on the slide. If you click on that, you'll have the option to either show or hide captions. You can adjust the font size to fit your preferences under subtitle settings. And our colleague Bernard Lim is here helping us ensure that all of the tech runs smoothly today. But if you do run into any technical issues, you can send him a direct note via Zoom. That brings us to today's episode of our discussion, Policy Making for Fair Labor Practices, where we'll be focusing on equitable enforcement and worker rights to support healthy families. At Change Lab Solutions, we define equitable enforcement as a process of ensuring compliance with laws or policies that considers and minimizes harms to underserved communities. When we talk about inequitable enforcement, we're usually looking at two separate concepts, over enforcement and under enforcement. Over enforcement occurs when laws are enforced more frequently or more strictly in certain places or against certain people as compared to others. Existing data suggests that over enforcement can adversely impact health and compound existing health inequities. Under enforcement occurs when laws that are designed to protect communities are not consistently enforced, often in already marginalized communities. Under enforcement in particular can be a significant challenge in labor and enforcement context. 
For example, enforcement of labor violations is generally complaint-based. These systems require workers to report abuses, often through complex formal systems, and place them at risk for retaliation. When policies also exist to protect, while policies also exist to protect workers against such retaliation, they often go unenforced as well, given the immense power and resource differentials between employers and employees and can result in wage theft and other labor abuses. We'll talk more about under enforcement and how we can combat these challenges as we hear from our speakers today. First though, I'd like to take a few moments to highlight the work that Change Lab Solutions has done in this space and the resources that are available. To help elevate equitable enforcement as a tool to achieve health equity, in 2020, we published a guide on equitable, equitable enforcement for policymakers and practitioners. The guide explores best practices in design and development of enforcement provisions that avoid inequitable impacts and promote community health. As the guide demonstrates, local jurisdictions around the country and even some states have taken important steps to consider this impact and mitigate inequities that are likely to result when enforcing a law or policy. This equitable enforcement guide has supported jurisdictions and entities at the forefront of the equitable enforcement movement as well as those interested in reconsidering their approach to enforcement actions. As a follow-up to our equitable enforcement guide, just this month, we've also released our equitable enforcement roadmap, which delineates the process and stakeholders involved in developing equitable enforcement provisions, particularly in the context of employment and labor standards. As we looked more specifically to equitable enforcement in the employment context, it became clear that for low wage work and in industries like caregiving, under enforcement can be a daunting challenge as conditions are ripe for wage theft and other abuses. While laws exist to protect workers, enforcement can be spotty and often difficult to navigate. We believe that enforcement is more effective and more equitable when it addresses root causes, targets those with more power to make systemic change, and reduces or eliminates barriers for those with less power. This guide allowed us to partner with several people and organizations doing work in this space to identify some of the strategies and resources they're using to overcome the challenges of enforcement and shift the burden of enforcement from employees to employers. As part of this resource, we've also created an equitable enforcement roadmap that we hope will provide some concrete examples of how to develop equitable policy and that highlights the many stakeholders that are involved in equitable, inclusive policymaking. For example, the community, researchers, elected lawmakers, administrators, and enforcing officials are all important players in the ecosystem of equitable enforcement. We're very fortunate to have many of those groups represented today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel of speakers and turn the conversation over to them. I'm thrilled to introduce our panelists today. First, Jen Round is the director of Beyond the Bill at the Workplace Justice Lab at Rutgers University. In this role, she works with agencies, lawmakers, worker organizations, and legal advocates across the US to more effectively protect the rights of low-wage workers. Jen facilitates partnership building between enforcement staff and community and worker advocates, and provides hands-on technical assistance to agencies working to transform their enforcement practices to achieve widespread compliance. Prior to joining the Workplace Justice Lab, Jen helped to launch and led enforcement at the Seattle Office of Labor Standards. There, she played an integral role in creating, evaluating, and revising Seattle's enforcement systems and procedures. Jen also carried out numerous policy projects at the agency and worked closely with community partners to ensure relationships were strong and synergetic. Before her time in Seattle, Jen worked for various legal aid organizations and academic institutions on access to justice and rule of law initiatives across the world, including in Bethel, Alaska, Kabul, Afghanistan, and Mesot, Thailand. Jen received her JD from the George Washington University Law School, her LLM from the University of Washington School of Law, and her BA from New York University. Elizabeth Wagner is the Deputy Commissioner of the Office of Labor Policy and Standards of the New York City Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, which she joined in 2019. OLPS enforces New York City worker protection laws, such as the Paid Safe and Sick Leave Law, the Fair Work Week laws, including just cause protections against wrongful firings for fast food workers, and the recently passed delivery worker laws, creating new rights for app-based food delivery workers. OLPS also houses the Paid Care Division, which is devoted to raising workplace standards for nannies, house cleaners, 
home health aides, and other paid care workers, and has recently launched an innovative new mediation program for domestic workers and employers to amicably resolve workplace disputes. Working closely with outside stakeholders, OLPS also advocates for new laws, performs research and data analysis to make policy recommendations, and conducts outreach and education to workers, employers, and the general public. Elizabeth has led some of OLPS's most impactful enforcement initiatives to achieve workplace-wide restitution for workers and bring companies into compliance, including a recent $20 million Fair Workweek recovery for Chipotle employees and a $2 million paid safe and sick leave recovery for home health aides. Prior to her current role, Elizabeth worked for the New York, I'm sorry, for the New Mexico Center on Law and Poverty, litigating impact cases to improve labor standards for workers in New Mexico. In prior roles, she litigated individual and class enforcement actions with the Labor Bureau of the New York Attorney General's Office, Outen and Golden LLP, and Make the Road New York. And Sharon Terman is Director of the Work and Family Program and Senior Staff Attorney at Legal Aid at Work, a nonprofit legal advocacy organization that advances the workplace rights of families with low incomes. Sharon counsels and represents pregnant and parenting workers and employees facing family medical crises, advocates for policy and systems change to promote family supportive workplaces, and educates the community. She's provided expert testimony before Congress on paid family and medical leave, served on Governor Newsom's paid family leave task force, and has helped craft several landmark state and local laws, improving work family supports, including laws expanding access to job protected leave, increasing benefit rates for paid family and medical leave, and strengthening lactation and caregiver accommodations. Thank you to all of you for being here. And so please let's jump right into our conversation. First, we wanna start the conversation by focusing on the ways in which there are systemic and structural challenges that require systemic and structural solutions. So I'll start with you, Sharon, to please answer our first question. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about your journey into working on labor and employment enforcement issues and talk a bit about how you uncovered that the system wasn't the working the way it was supposed to. We'll start with Sharon, but then I'll ask each of you to please jump in. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, Holly, for having me. I'm really excited to be a part of this conversation. Um, you asked about my journey to this work. Um, as you mentioned, I direct the work and family program at Legal Aid at Work. And I've spent the last 17 years here advocating for and enforcing and helping to educate folks about family supportive workplace policies. Um, policies like paid family leave, job protected leave, paid sick leave, and accommodations for pregnancy, for lactation, for caregiving, um, for folks' own conditions. And really, it's been clear from the outset that our policies have not adequately supported low-paid workers and historically marginalized workers who need these protections the most. Um, at Legal Aid at Work, we run a free confidential helpline for low-paid workers across California, um, and they call every day with questions and concerns about their workplace rights. And, um, you know, especially when they're going through a family medical crisis or welcoming a new child into the home, you can really see where our laws are failing, folks. Um, they, these callers really point out where the gaps in the laws are, uh, where they're falling through the cracks um, in the policies themselves, but also they point out the barriers to access and enforcement. Um, and those are things like, you know, folks just aren't aware of their rights, of the full um, the full panoply of rights available to them. Um, employers are not complying with the rights. Um, and also folks are having to navigate really overly burdensome systems for accessing and enforcing their rights. Um, we also represent folks whose rights are denied. And in a range of ways. So from everything from helping folks to advocate for themselves, like writing an email to your employer, or educating them that actually I do have this right, um, writing demand letters and negotiating with employers on workers' behalf, and also taking formal legal action through administrative enforcement agencies and through litigation. And through all of this work, we really see that low paid workers, immigrant workers, workers of color, especially women of color, are least likely to have access to these protections and most likely to fear and face retaliation when they exercise their rights, um, which is especially true for undocumented workers, classified workers, 
and others who are in precarious work environments. So all of this just really points to the need to design policies and enforcement mechanisms with these communities in mind so that folks can access their rights to care for themselves, care for their loved ones without having to risk their livelihood, um, which is why I'm excited to be a part of this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jen, can I ask you to chime in and share a bit about your uh, journey in labor and employment enforcement as well? Sure. So, um, you know, you mentioned this earlier, but I sort of started doing more international rule of law access to justice work and was seeing over and over again how laws that were meant to protect people were not serving them. And so eventually I went to work for the city of Seattle as my first sort of government job, my first job on the inside. Um, and I started at the Office for Civil Rights, which initially in Seattle was enforcing the paid sick leave law. Um, and what the way they were doing it was they were enforcing paid sick as if it were a civil rights law. So it was like a one-off, right? They were only enforcing it for the person who was making the complaint, which meant there would generally be a settlement agreement. And sometimes that settlement agreement would only remedy the harm for the complainant, meaning the rest of the workforce wasn't receiving any kind of remedy. That obviously didn't make a lot of sense. And so um, from there, the Office of Labor Standards in Seattle uh, sort of was born out of the Office for Civil Rights. They inherited the paid sick leave law, as well as minimum wage, wage theft, fair scheduling. And, and now there's a whole slew of other laws there. Um, and so when we when we were creating the office or when we were launching the Office of Labor Standards, you know, we were really looking for other models of enforcement of labor standards enforcement. At the time, um, San Francisco was the only other municipal uh, agency that was you know, doing minimum wage and wage theft work. Um, and so what we were able to learn from San Francisco was, you know, they had a strong uh, partnerships with community organizations who had trusted relationships with workers. And so Seattle, you know, kind of took that model. And so we were able to start from the very beginning with these community partners sort of at the center of our enforcement model. But, you know, what we learned really quickly was that this is really difficult, right? It's hard to be the government and, um, you know, with all the bureaucracy and all the red tape and all the sort of the hoops you have to jump through and the limited amounts of resources resources you have, it's hard to do this job well. And so when I left Seattle, you know, I, I started working at the Workplace Justice Lab, where we really tried to help agencies at the local, state, and federal level learn from each other, you know, share best practices and lessons learned to enforce these laws in a way that is meaningful, um, you know, for underserved communities and historically marginalized workers. Thank you. Liz, can we turn to you also for your history and background? Yeah, um, thanks. It's so interesting to hear folks sort of journey to the work. Um, uh, I guess you know, my version of it would be when I started off, my first legal job was at Make the Road New York, which is a community organizing and legal services organization um, that mostly supports um, undocumented um, low income workers um, with um, a variety of different issues. And I worked on the the the, the employment and workers rights side um, of the legal work and, um, you know, non pay wage theft is a big issue um, that workers faced um, or workers that came to us faced, and we would help them file complaints with the New York State Department of Labor. Um, and kind of through that work, um, you know, a number of things that you wouldn't necessarily expect, and, you know, absolutely, if you weren't doing the work, you know, became really sort of apparent and shocking. Um, you know, first, just how hard it was to file a complaint, the lack of language access, um, the, you know, years and years of backlogs before the complaint would even be investigated. Um, and, you know, sort of seeing that over and over again, you know, it sort of became clear that, you know, I had assumed that if a law is on the books, that means that that law exists and is a real protection for people. And that just isn't actually true. You know, there actually is not a minimum wage for lots and lots of people um, absent, you know, effective enforcement of the law. Um, and so, you know, that that was um, really eye opening. Um, and I think in the roles that I've held since then um, have all been sort of geared towards, you know, what are the different ways you can tackle that kind of problem of making rights that are on the books real for workers. Um, um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about kind of how OPS, uh, my office now does that um, or is trying to do that, you know, it's, nothing's perfect. Um, but, uh, um, you know, it's very exciting to have the opportunity to, to try to, to make it work and to make protections real for people from the inside. Great, thank you. 
I want to step back just a bit and ask, I'll start with you, Jen. Could you please orient us as to why equitable enforcement of fair labor policies is so critical to family stability and building a more inclusive economy? And then I'll invite uh, Sharon or Liz to jump in after that. Sure. And some of this is going to echo, Holly, what you've already said and also what Sharon has said. But, you know, just taking a step back, right, we pass these laws to raise the floor, especially in low wage exploitative industries where, you know, as a city, as a state, as a country, we find the conditions to be unacceptably low. Right. But passing the law is just the first step. Right. Without strong enforcement that really considers the realities of low wage workers, we're going to see high rates of violations that impact women, workers of color and immigrants, especially at district proportionate rates, right? So a couple of examples, you know, during the COVID pandemic at the very beginning, Congress acted and passed the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, right, which temporarily created paid sick and family and medical leave for millions of workers. So before the protections expired in December 2020, the U.S. was as close as it's ever been to providing near universal paid leave, right? Despite this, leave was not evenly accessible. So there was a survey done in 2020 called the Just Recovery Survey, which found that Black workers workers were more than three times as likely than white workers to have requested paid sick leave or paid family leave and to have been denied, right? So we have inequitable access. Similar, 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 similarly, <laughs> research has also repeatedly demonstrated that workers of color, women, and immigrants are more likely to experience minimum wage violations, right? Wage theft. So um, we just finished a study um, on Texas where we found that minimum wage violations cost individual workers nearly $4,000 per year, right? These are minimum wage workers. They're $4,000 per year being stolen in minimum wage violations alone. I'll remind everyone, Texas is a 725 minimum wage state, right? This this is a huge amount of money, so much so that it was driving these workers' income to fall below the national poverty line. So at the same time, we have this huge amount of money being stolen from these workers. We also see that the likelihood of having your wages stolen is dependent on demographics, right? So women um, were 67% uh, more likely than men to experience a minimum wage violation. Uh, Non-citizens were 68% more likely than citizens to experience a minimum wage violation. Latinx workers were 27% more likely than white workers. Workers. And then as it relates to family, we found that parents were 25% more likely than non-parents to experience minimum wage violations, right? So we know that violations are happening, you know, they're disproportionately shouldered by some groups of workers. Now, despite these widespread labor standards violations, particularly in low-wage industries, and despite how devastating these consequences are for workers, what we're seeing across the country is that the vast majority of labor standards agencies rely on complaint-based enforcement. Holly, this is what you talked about at the top of the top of the um, webinar, right? So what does this mean? It means that the enforcement model um, that most agencies in this country are using is based on the presumption that workers who experience a violation will speak up, right? But we know this is not true. We have data that tells us this is not true, right? So studies that we have done and that others have done for cities and states across the, across the country have demonstrated that some of the most regularly exploited workers are among the least likely to complain, right? So what we've seen again and again is that enforcement that relies on complaints alone overlooks workers in some of the highest violation industries. So the consequence of this, right, the consequence of complaint-based only enforcement is that where enforcement is most needed, few investigations are being triggered. So one example of this, right, in practically all of the studies we have done, we have found that the industry that's called private households, which is the industry that employs domestic workers and some home health workers, has the highest rate of violations and the lowest rate of complaints, right? So for example, we did a study in San Francisco where we found that in the private household industry, for every one minimum wage complaint, there was 1,327 minimum wage violations, right? So what we know is that the complaint-based model alone is insufficient. So this gets us to what is an equitable approach to enforcement, right? What an equitable approach to enforcement requires is that agencies are not relying solely on complaints to trigger an enforcement action, right? Agencies need to do proactive investigations where they target high violation, low complaint industries. In part, this requires data, right? We need agencies, we need government to be um, getting data and looking at data and understanding how, you know, what they're doing based on data that's available. So we need proactive investigations and and, you know, what we know is that when one worker in a work at a at a workplace is experiencing like a minimum wage violation or a paid sick leave violation, generally many workers are experiencing that 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 type of violation, right? So we also need company-wide investigations. 
Um, and then one last important thing to note, right, is that a lot of these workers in, in highly exploitative industries are not coming forward because they face barriers to interacting with the government, right? So to do these, these types of investigations well, we also need agencies to be partnering with worker centers, legal nonprofits, unions, organizations on the ground that have the trust of workers, right? Because we're going to need those organizations to help build those workers' trust in order for them to participate um, in, in these investigations, right, to help prove that the violations are happening. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Liz or Sharon, anything you'd like to jump in and add just about, um, you know, the impacts that you've seen or how this is so important in particular for domestic workers and children and families? I'm happy to hop in. Um, you know, I, I agree with with. Um, everything Jen is saying, um, you know, and I think, uh, you know, from speaking from the perspective of uh, a local labor enforcement agency, um, you know, I think it is really critically important um, that, you know, when when we, you know, I, and I think this is something that we sort of, is, I used to say, is sort of a guiding principle for us, um, you know, when um, a worker files a complaint with our office, um, it is our policy and practice in every complaint to really look at, you know, what is the um, likely scope of the violations this person is reporting? Um, so, you know, in the sick time context, you know, a worker who, you know, says they don't offer sick time at this company. Um, it makes no sense uh, to just pursue an investigation for that one person um, where, you know, the sort of overarching goal that we have as an agency is to ensure that everyone in New York City is getting sick time as the law requires, right? We will not achieve that goal um, unless we are looking at the appropriate scope of the investigation um, and the appropriate scope of the violations. Um, you know, not every case is like that. You know, we get plenty of cases too where there was like a mix up in HR and, you know, the worker just didn't get paid and you know, it's easy to resolve those, you know, but where a company isn't um, offering the benefit at all, um, you know, that's something that, you know, we have to really look at that and not just turn a blind eye to what's going on um, elsewhere. Um, I mean, I think other ways that it's, you know, it's important to sort of tackle this is, um, you know, to make it really easy for workers to report issues to us, to accept anonymous complaints, you know, not require them to put their name to it, um, you know, to not reveal workers' names in the investigation, um, to not require anybody to fill out a form, right? You can file a complaint with us by just sending us an email saying, here's what's going on. You know, you don't have to do anything more than that. Um, you know, so really low barriers to re pro providing the information to us. Um, you know, I will say that in terms of, you know, these cases where a company's just flouting the law, you know, you need witnesses. Um, and so, you know, we also have, you know, to be able to like bring that case to court and actually change what's going on. Um, but I think it's absolutely correct that we can't, as enforcers, expect people to stick their neck out and file a complaint and put their name to it, because um, that's going to be really dangerous for people. Retaliation is real. Um, so some of the things that we do to try to sort of mitigate some of that um, are we have a fast track retaliation program where if a worker does agree to have their name revealed um, and there are any consequences to them, we fast, you know, head of the line, you know, first priority is try to get that person back to work and file the case if we can't get them back to work. And we've been successful doing that. Um, another is um, doing um, broad text messaging and emails. So we'll get in our investigation a list of workers' emails and phone numbers, um, you know, when we're doing a workplace-wide investigation. And we'll then send out a survey to everyone in that workplace, you know, asking them to report information to us about what they're seeing. Um, and that way we have a like, broad amount of like anecdotes and information from the whole workforce that we can use in an enforcement action. So, you know, we try to think really creatively about how do we prevent just this one person from being the only person who has to make this whole investigation happen. 
Um, and then just the last thing I want to say about this is, um, you know, another guiding principle for us is ensuring that the ways that we're enforcing the law or supporting workers are responsive to community needs, like enforcement and litigation and fighting, not always how people want to approach a particular issue. Um, and so the Na National Domestic Workers Alliance came to us a few years ago saying, hey, you know, it would be really good for our members to have a non-adversarial way to tackle workplace disputes that arise, like wage theft issues, you know, benefits issues, um, you know, so it's not like we're going and enforcing this, but, you know, let's all come to the table together to talk about what the right way to do it and sort of achieve an outcome that, you know, preserves that employment relationship. And so sort of through those conversations, we've developed a domestic worker mediation program where workers can come to us, you know, we'll kind of issue spot the issues and invite the employer to the table to a mediation uh, with a neutral for the, for the parties to come together and try to resolve that dispute. So brand new, you know, to, we'll see how it goes, um, but we're really excited about it as sort of a different approach that's meeting a community need. I really love that. And um, I will say just from our experience interacting with workers every day on our helpline, I think it's very true that um, folks aren't necessarily looking for a lawsuit. They're not looking to, you know, go all the way to court um, to vindicate their rights. Um, they want to keep their jobs. They want to take care of themselves, take care of their health, take care of their family's health. And so um, whatever we can do to try to um, prevent violations in the first place or intervene early um, to, to help folks resolve disputes, I think is absolutely critical. We um, just recently, as a couple examples on our helpline, you know, got calls from a couple people independently who whose employers were claiming they didn't have the tenure to qualify for job protected leave. There was one older gentleman who wanted to care for his wife who was under, undergoing treatment for a serious illness. And um, the employer had been taken over by a, another company and the new company said, oh, your tenure with the prior company doesn't count for your year in service for family medical leave. And therefore you're denied these weeks that you need to care for your wife. And he thought, how can it be? It's the same job, it's the same supervisor. You know, How could you discount that time? And it turns out under the law, they can't. Uh, they have to count that time, their successor and in interest. And so my colleague wrote an email, you know, a simple email from in his voice, you know, where he could send to his HR manager and say, hey, I think you may not be aware, but under the FMLA, um, you count as a successor and in interest. And therefore, my entire tenure should count and I should qualify for this leave. And the employer immediately reversed their decision and granted him the leave that he needed and kept his job. And his wife was able to have him there, you know, when she needed him. Um, we had a, another call the same week from a woman who was on medical leave and her employer, same thing. She was working with a staffing agency at the same employer. Um, and they said, oh, your time with the staffing agency doesn't count. And so they, they took away her health insurance benefits while she was on medical leave, a time when she really needed her health insurance benefits. And, um, and again, my colleague wrote a letter for her to send to her employer and they reinstated her health benefits. I mean, I, so I think that having tools like that with the assistance of agencies, enforcement agencies, you know, to the extent that there are really detailed regulations frequently asked questions on the websites of these enforcement agencies that workers can point their employers to, to say, hey, you might not have seen, but rule 2.0 on the website of the enforcement agency, it points out that I'm actually entitled to this and you're, you know, please make it right. And therefore we can avoid a complaint in the first place. Um, and that is so critical for preserving preserving employment for preserving, you know, health and well-being of families and, you know, the stability of um, families and communities. Wonderful. Thank you. I want to ask just one more sort of framing question quickly before we move on. And I think you've already, um, each of you talked about some of this, but want to make sure we didn't miss anything. I'll start with Liz. Um, is there anything else you want to say about some of the trends in enforcement of labor practices over the last few years, especially as it relates to domestic workers and children and families? I think I mostly said what I what I wanted to say there. Um, so, you know, just in the interest of, of, of going through the agenda, I'll, I'll cede my time. <laughs> 
Perfect. Jen or Sharon, anything we missed there? We certainly have lots of other things we can move on to. Perfect. Well, then I want to shift slightly to talking about how we can move from just acknowledging issues to actually taking action. So Sharon, I'd like to start with you. How do we go, uh, best go about centering the community we're serving in decision-making and make sure that decisions, policies, and enforcement of the provisions actually address the needs of the community? Yeah, I mean, I think this is really important. And obviously we need to have directly impacted communities and community-based organizations at the table at every step of the way, informing and designing these laws, sharing their stories uh, with policymakers, with agency leaders who are enforcing and, and undergoing rulemaking um, and educating the community um, and to really building in those feedback loops so that we can constantly assess, are these laws working on the ground? If not, how can we inform future improvements? And then I think the other piece is really understanding what it looks like for a worker who is experiencing a violation or a family medical crisis. What does it look like them um, look like for them to actually understand and navigate their rights? So if you take, for example, a grocery store cashier in California um, finds out that her child has a serious illness and needs to take leave from work to care for that child. Right now, the way our system is set up is that that worker has to navigate multiple actors and agencies, entities to fully understand and access her rights. So she will have to talk to her employer, a union if she's lucky to have a union, um, the Employment Development Department, which is the agency that administers paid family leave benefits, as well as her child's health care provider who is going to have to certify um, her need for benefits and for job protected leave. So already you're talking about a pretty complicated system just to understand and get the rights that you're entitled to. And then when you think about what happens if the employer denies her that leave or you know, takes action against her for requesting or taking it. So at that point, she has to go to at least two, maybe more different enforcement agencies, um, the California Civil Rights Department, which enforces the right to job protected family leave. And then the labor commissioner, which enforces the right to paid sick leave, and possibly a local enforcement agency if she's lucky enough to live in a jurisdiction that has a paid sick leave law that goes above and beyond what California law provides. And each of these agencies and, and processes have different statutes of limitations, different lengthy, complex processes. Um, and if she just starts with one, in general, that agency is only going to tell them, tell her about the process um, that's within their purview. And so she, it'll be up to her to have to figure out and reach out to the others. Um, and I think the other thing to think about is, you know, as I alluded to earlier, and we talked about and, and Liz talked about, you know, this is often like really time sensitive um, issues that people are, are experiencing, right? So if you need pregnancy leave or paid sick leave or lactation accommodations, you can't afford to wait years, you know, months or years for an agency to complete your, its investigation. You need your rights right now. And so really thinking about innovative programs like the mediation program that Liz mentioned and other ways to kind of strategically and um, enforce these time sensitive, sensitive rights um, is, is really critical. Just to jump in kind of on that theme of, of keeping it simple, you know, I think um, um, where that really hits me is in, um, you know, some of the laws that we enforce, you know, we sort of describe ourselves in OPS as enforcing the second generation of labor protections. Um, you know, we don't do minimum wage and overtime. Um, you know, we're preempted under state law from doing minimum wage and overtime. Um, but our laws, um, you know, we we have fair scheduling laws um, that apply to workers in fast food and retail. We have delivery worker protections that give at-based delivery workers um, control over their working conditions um, and, and allow us to set a minimum pay rate. Um, and I think, you know, legal frameworks like that, um, um, you know, are arise out of, um, you know, workers' experiences um, with issues like, you know, maybe their employer, you know, in a fast food restaurant is has been perfectly compliant with minimum wage and overtime. But, you know, a major issue that workers were experiencing was, you know, scheduling unpredictability, um, you know, so not getting 
a regular slate of hours, never knowing how much people are going to earn from week to week, having to stay late unexpectedly, having their hours cut unexpectedly. Um, and so kind of arising out of that experience, um, you know, advocates, you know, and, and the city council passed uh, in 2017, a fair scheduling law um, that requires workers to have regular schedules. Employers can't cut their hours unless they pay them premium pay. You can't make workers work late um, unless you, um, um, get their consent to work late. So they have a right to say no and leave on time. Um, and then workers have a right to pick up more hours so that they can move into full-time work if they want that. Um, so, you know, all of these protections, you know, in really clear ways addressing problems that workers are experiencing. Um, and yet, you know, it can get quite technical. Um, and, you know, the the rights that I just described, you know, kind of a, like a lot of work has gone into um, are, you know, even being able to talk about these rights and why they're important. Um, and, you know, certainly for a worker, you know, who's just experiencing ongoing scheduling instability in the workplace, um, you know, we as an agency, you know, we have needed to develop systems to evaluate compliance, um, you know, using kind of technical expertise um, beyond, you know, what a worker would have or should be expected to have. Um, and so, you know, what that has like, you know, looked like, you know, in terms of translating these like really critical needs that workers have for scheduling stability to like, a, an enforcement system that could feasibly achieve compliance in the industry has been, you know, staffing up our operation um, with data scientists who can like write code to, you know, evaluate time, schedule, and pay records to find, you know, where were their schedule changes? Did the company maintain evidence of an exception to uh, the right to receive premium pay for a schedule change? You know, is the company offering available shifts to current workers before hiring new workers? You know, are people having that ability to move into full-time work? Um, and, you know, so I think, you know, really kind of important part of like centering the community's needs is, you know, how well are we doing as an agency at, you know, taking these important legal frameworks rooted in people's experiences and developing a unique enforcement structure that will make those rights real on the ground. And I'll just jump in and one, give huge props to New York City for having data scientists and doing that recruitment and prioritizing that because so few agencies- I love them. And it's so, it's so incredibly important. Um, and, and then just like one thing to Sharon's point about sort of, you know, this sort of this incredibly complex sort of spider web of agencies and, and procedures and statute limitations and legal requirements. Um, you know, what, one thing just to note is like that's a that's that, that's not the case in other countries, right? Other countries have more unitarian approaches to enforcement where they actually do try to think of how do these systems intersect and what how can we create and design systems that actually work for working people. Um, and so just to point that out and, you know, and I'll note, like, especially with state agencies, we've tried to work with state agencies to get, in, you know, in one department of labor, they may be a state um, OSHA and a state wage and hour. And those two units cannot share information with each other, even if they have a case that totally overlaps. Right. And then and so unless you get an MOU and it, it's totally complex and their systems don't talk to each other. And so really, you know, going deep on these issues that kind of seem like a little bit you know, you know, like, well, like, what are, you know, like, but it's really important for organizations that are doing this work to go deep on sort of this bureaucratic mess, because it does matter for people, right? It does matter for workers, um, even though it seems kind of like, you know, I don't know, esoteric and, and, and a little bit like outside of the realm of what we normally think of when we're talking about advocacy. And then the, the other thing I would just add, right, is like, we need we need community organizations on the ground to do outreach, to do education, to do training, and also to help bring workers to the agency and help workers navigate these processes. And we need organizations to have resources and capacity to do that. And so where government is able to step in and provide that funding, um, which we're seeing more and more, especially at the municipal level, like that's a really critical, important thing that should be prioritized. So, you know, just to provide a couple of examples where we're seeing this, you know, the Seattle Office of Labor Standards, which like I mentioned earlier, I, I came from there, but they have a community outreach and education fund, which was launched in 2015, the same year that the office opened its doors, which gives one 
$1.5 million a year in funding to 15 community organizations and worker centers that have relationships with historically marginalized communities. San Francisco also has $750,000 in grants to legal service orgs and worker centers. Minneapolis has $370,000 that they grant to their community partners, right? So we're seeing this in more and more places and where we can, right, advocating and trying to get government to do this, especially at the state level where we don't see it so much is really important, um, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. And Jen, I wanna follow up just a little bit about that. You talked some about the you know, challenges of the decentralized uh, way that we have organizations, uh, things organized here, as well as you know, some of the promising approaches. Could you talk specifically about maybe one employment related enforcement strategy that you think would have the greatest impact on creating a more equitable and inclusive economy? Sure. And I think everyone's touched on this already, but I mean, the big one I think is, is retaliation, right? We need strong anti-retaliation laws and enforcement to ensure that workers who do come forward and who do participate in enforcement actions um, are protected against exploitative employers, you know, who retaliate against them. So, um, you know, at its core, retaliation is really an attack on the rule of law, right? Retaliation targets workers who speak out, and it has a chilling effect on other workers to, to keep them quiet, right? That's, a, that's part of the reason that retaliation happens. And so, you know, the other thing is we know that retaliation is a really widespread problem. Any advocates who have worked with workers who have gone through the system have seen it, but, you know, there's, there's, there has been research on it. So we know, you know, in one national study, 43% of workers who complained to their employers uh, reported they experienced retaliation. A recent study, uh, survey from NELP of California workers found that 40 or 54% of workers who reported um, they were reported being retaliated against after they told their employer or an agency that they'd experienced a violation, right? This study also found that fear of retaliation stopped workers from speaking out um, and that this was an experience that uh, was experienced uh, by um, Black and Latinx workers far, at far greater rates than white workers. So again, right, there's inequities in the retaliation and how that's experienced. And so as far as enforcement goes, like one thing just to name is that retaliation investigations are very different than other types of labor standards investigations. Like a minimum wage investigation and retaliation invest investigation are just substantively different. You need different evidence. You need different types of interviews. It's a different legal analysis. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we need to make sure is that investigators have special training so that they understand how to collect and analyze relevant evidence as it comes to retaliation so that they can prove it because too often retaliation isn't proved even when workers do come forward, right? Um, agencies also need to do what they can to prevent retaliation, right? Something that Sharon mentioned, right? Like we need, if we can, we need to stop the harm from ever, from even happening. Cause once the genie is out of the bottle, right? There's a lot of collateral damage that comes with retaliation. And so, um, you know, identifying strategies and resources to try to, to try to stop retaliation before it happens is important. Another thing is really trying to, um, agencies need to intervene as soon as possible when retaliation does happen. So this could look like a temporary restraining order or like Liz mentioned, right, our expedited process so that when retaliation occurs, the agency is looking at it first and doing what they can as quickly as possible, you know, to, to stem the harm, to, 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 to get at whatever is happening. And then lastly, right, agencies need the statutory authority and they need to use the statutory authority to really be able to assess remedies that account for the full range of direct and collateral damage, right? So if you have a low-wage worker who's terminated in, you know, because they came forward, that, that worker may be evicted, right? They may have moving costs. They may not be able to pay their credit card bills, other bills, right? So then they have all these late fees. And so, you know, it, investigators need to know which questions to ask to fully understand the, you know, the full range of harm and then to have the resources and the ability to come up with a remedy that accounts for all of that. Thank you. And we definitely have a lot of folks in the chat who are echoing and uh, relating a lot to your discussion of how important retaliation is and what a big piece of the puzzle that is. So thank you. Um, finally, as we talk about this section, I want to turn and I'll go to you first, Sharon. So given all the stakeholders that are involved in enforcement of employment provisions, can you speak to how these different stakeholders, whether it's government or direct services organization, researchers or communities, can really leverage their strengths to best collaborate together to bring more stability for working families? 
Yeah. So, and I think that um, the roadmap that you all created really speaks to this. Um, but I think ideally you have communities and direct service organizations um, working together to advocate for laws that are more responsive, for enforcement mechanisms that really work on the ground. And then you would have government, as Jen said, you know, partnering with and funding community-based organizations to effectively get the word out about worker protections. Um, and that looks like, you know, trying to break down those silos among different agencies and um, giving holistic resources and information to folks about what the full picture of their rights looks like and how to how to navigate those rights. And then also partnering with those CBOs to bring back the systemic cases to the enforcement agencies for them to vigorously enforce and publicize um, those enforcement actions. And then you have researchers who should be supporting the advocacy by documenting both the importance and impact of these policies on family stability and well-being, um, but also helping to counter opposition arguments. You know, we often hear about um, arguments about, you know, meaningful enforcement um, provisions where the other side will say, you know, oh, the sky is going to fall, it's going to open the floodgates for litigation, and it's going to harm businesses. And so if you have researchers who can say, actually, this has been a win-win, for businesses and workers, um, that can be really powerful. And I think that researchers and government also have a really important role to play in helping to um, design complaint processes and enforcement processes that folks can easily um, navigate um, and do things like user testing and co-designing um, systems with community members to make sure they're really working. Um, and, you know, basically all of these actors should be um, in, working in, in collaboration and have these ongoing feedback loops to address systemic barriers to enforcement and um, asking questions like, okay, what are the industries in which the violations are most prevalent? Um, what are the obstacles on the ground to, to folks who are trying to vindicate their rights? How do we need to tweak the law going forward? Um, and then I think, you know, just as a concrete example, you know, when a private litigant is, you know, seeking to to enforce their rights in court and face obstacles like arbitration clauses or class action waivers, that's an extra important opportunity to partner with government um, who aren't bound by those things um, and have them, you know, work together to bring those systemic cases to maximize impact. Um, and then just, you know, obviously a really critical component whenever we're talking about worker protections is unions and the role of unions and the importance of strengthening unions um, to increase worker voice. Thank you. Liz or Jen, anything you want to um, jump in or add or specifically to talk about kind of the lessons that we should be learning about um, successful implementation and enforcement approaches to try and leverage these benefits and continue to make uh, make strides. I guess one thing that, well, go ahead, Jen, you first. No, 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 you go ahead. I just kind of building on the conversation about, you know, retaliation and the chilling effect that that has, you know, it, it, like retaliation is easy to do for or easier for employers to do um, because the the framework that exists is at will employment um, where a worker the rule is a worker can be fired for any reason or no reason at all um, and so you know an employer who fires a worker for uh, filing a complaint or bringing up unlawful conduct that the employer has engaged in, um, you know, it's it's the employer can fire that worker and give no reason. And, you know, just on the surface, that looks legal. Um, it's then on the enforcement agency or the worker themselves to prove that there was an illegal reason. Um, one sort of legal tweak and change that's happening in New York um, in the fast food industry is in 2021, a new law went into effect um, that uh, requires an employer to have just cause to terminate a worker. Um, and what and that applies only in fast food right now. But what it means is uh, when the you know an employer has to give workers an opportunity to improve if they're having you know some type of issue you know in the workplace, you're not cleaning the grill correctly, not mopping well, you know whatever it is, um, you can't just fire someone. Uh, for any reason or no reason at all, you have to be giving them disciplinary warnings, an opportunity to improve, et cetera. And, you know, while that applies to everyone, it is not just about retaliation, could be any number of issues. 
it uh, makes it very hard to fire a worker in retaliation um, because uh, there's just there's not cause. And so, you know, we've gotten these cases where a worker is fired in retaliation um, for asserting a protected right. The employer really has no cause to fire them. And, you know, we are able to put those people back to work quickly and much more easily because we don't have to prove retaliation. It's on the employer to prove that they had cause to terminate that person. So those are really powerful protections, you know, really important part of this whole enforcement framework uh, to just in general require more proof on the employer side before um, ending the employment relationship with someone. And um, I, I'll just jump in and take kind of like a, a bigger step, like a bigger step back, right? But um, right, if we want these new and existing policies, right, to really be wielded on and on, on, but by and on behalf of workers in ways that actually lead to significant improvements in workplace conditions and in, you know, traditionally exploitative industries, we need the power, the attention, the effort and political will that is used to pass the substantive right, whether it's paid sick leave or fair scheduling, right, whatever it is. Um, to, to be used to ensure that agencies have the resources and the powers that they need to actually implement and enforce these laws, right? So too often what we're seeing is that labor standards agencies, you know, a, a new labor standards law is passed. So it's, you know, it could be fair scheduling, which is a huge law. Like Liz, Liz mentioned, you need data scientists, you need all these things. And the agency that's charged with enforcing it, get, enforcing it gets no new staffing, no additional outreach and education budget, no new administrative staff, no new legal support, no new tech support, right? So they're supposed to do this whole new job with no new resources. And when we do this, we're making it virtually impossible for these agencies to actually fulfill their mandate, which means that we're gonna to continue to see violations that disproportionately impact certain workers, historically marginalized workers, right? And what we're also doing is setting these agencies up to fail, right? To not do not do their jobs or not do their jobs well. Um, so, you know, so we need, enforcement agencies that have the staffing and that have the resources in order to, to do these laws justice. On the other hand, right, what we see too often is that in the fight and in the compromise to get the law passed, the, you know, paid sick leave, minimum wage, whatever it is, what's often left on the negotiating table are strong enforcement powers that the agency really needs to find remedy and to deter violations, right? So this could be strong retaliation protections or like Liz mentioned, just cause um, or high penalties and damages so that employers understand that the cost of non-compliance is much higher you know, than the cost of compliance. Um, it could be a fair statute of limitations. It could be the express ability to do company-wide or proactive investigations. It could be strong collections tools. It could be a private right of action so that there is another path for redress if the agency doesn't have the capacity to take every single investigation, right? So, you know, so the resources and the enforcement powers can't be an afterthought, right? When we're thinking about campaigns for these laws, but they, you know, they need to be an integral, integral part of any campaign that is working to get new workers' rights laws enacted. Wonderful. Thank you. On that note, we have just a few minutes left. The time has gone by really quickly. Um, so I want to spend our last few minutes just talking uh, about looking toward the future. So what makes you excited about doing this work and where are we seeing some opportunities to expand the work and make some progress? I'll turn it uh, first to Liz, if you don't mind. Oh, I feel like I always answer the question before it's asked. I think like um, I think just cause is a big one. It's still a new one for us, um, you know, and, and still sort of figuring out what that looks like from the government side, um, you know, to be enforcing uh, a protection like that. Um, I think um, I, I haven't spoken very much about app based delivery worker protections, um, but I think this is a new and really, really important area. You know, these are workers who are classified as independent contractors, um, you know, the sort of big delivery apps, um, you know, don't classify workers as employees. Um, and, you know, what we've been charged with doing by city council is to say, OK, you know, they're classified as independent contractors. Um, so, you know, what can we do to create a level of parity with employees so that, 
you know, regardless of classification, there's no financial incentive to classify someone as an employee or as an independent contractor. And that means things like um, a minimum pay rate that adequately compensates people for the work that they do, um, you know, giving workers certain control over their routes and distances um, for health and safety reasons. Um, and so, you know, that is a new area for us, um, you know, in that space um, that, that is very, very exciting. It's a huge, huge workforce in New York City. Um, you know, so I think just in general, like, you know, getting the opportunity to enforce that second generation of labor protections, figuring out how to make them work and figuring out how to replicate them so that other jurisdictions can, can um, you know, do the same thing when it's working well for us. Yeah. I'm happy to, to go next. Um, yeah, I think that during COVID, we've seen some promising efforts and opportunities that I think we can learn from and, and try to expand. Um, one example is in California, our labor and workforce development agency um, has led a COVID worker outreach program in partnership with dozens of community-based organizations um, who are helping to educate folks in low-wage jobs and industries about their COVID-related leave rights and benefits. And the labor agency um, contracted with um, Legal Aid to Work and a number of um, labor um, and health organizations and community organizations to create um, not just comprehensive um, fact sheets and materials that kind of break down those silos we talked about, but also a, a worker-centered online navigator that um, brings together all the different rights um, in one place. So a worker could type in, for example, I have COVID or my child has COVID, and then it'll tell you all the rights you have in one place. Um, and you don't have to go to multiple different entities to figure out your rights. So I think that's one thing that we can really learn from and try to apply um, to not just, you know, COVID, but everything, you know, all of the rights that workers have. And, and again, to echo Jen, you know, build in as well, the funding and the staff and the systems um, for the purpose of that sustained community engagement and outreach and feedback. Um, and the other thing I'm excited about is just continuing to make kind of the health equity case and draw the connections um, between worker protections and health and well-being, because I think so often in worker protection fights, um, the narrative is about, you know, workers versus businesses. But if you can kind of shift that paradigm and highlight how, you know, and we saw this during COVID, I mean, paid sick leave saves lives. Um, it literally is a life and death issue. And so, um, you know, I think having, you know, bringing more diverse partners, public health partners into these conversations can really help, um, help us in, you know, shifting the narrative and, and in ensuring equitable um, access and enforcement of these rights. Um, I'll just say really quickly, you know, I talked to, I talked to the beginning about complaint based enforcement and how that's the, you know, that's the model that the vast majority of agencies in the US use. I think, you know, the bright spot is we're actually seeing more and more agencies sort of turn towards what we call strategic enforcement, which is really looking at how to proactively, um, you know, aim your resources at high violation, low complaint industries. And so we're seeing that at the, both the municipal, the state and the federal level. And so it does feel like slowly but surely um, there are agencies that are, you know, that are um, really trying to get data, understand what is missing from their current enforcement model and trying to create partnerships um, and change the way that they do things in order to, you know, to fill the gaps that have historically been there. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for taking your time to talk both about some of the challenges, but also some opportunities and bright spots. We do have just a few minutes left uh, and uh, had preserved some time for some questions and answers. So thanks to all of you who submitted great questions with your registration and during the session. Um, Maya, do we have any pending questions that we'd like the panel to uh, spend a few moments answering? Yes, um, Candace raised a question about connections between worker protections and experiences of intimate partner violence or child abuse and neglect. I don't know that we spent much time talking about paid leave, um, paid safe leave. If um, some of you would like to, to speak on that, I think that would be welcome. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I really appreciate that question. I'm happy to to start. Um, it's obviously a hugely important issue for um, survivors of intimate partner violence to have paid leave and job protected leave to go to court, get a restraining order, seek services, um, take steps to protect their safety and the safety of their children. And fortunately, we do have um, some laws on the books that provide paid leave for those reasons. Um, I think, and we also have some, actually in California and a number of other states have some job protected leave laws that provide longer term leaves for those reasons as well. Um, I think education and outreach is um, really critical and partnering with trusted messengers, um, domestic violence uh, support counselors, um, rape crisis centers, um, to make sure where there's a lot of turnover in those organizations. So, you know, again, sustained community partnerships with organizations and um, that, that serve survivors as well as government entities um, that enforce these provisions is really critical to make sure because we know that enforcement is low on, of those rights in particular. I mean, there've been very few complaints of the laws that we have here in California. So um, so it's an important, important effort that deserves more attention. Yeah, uh, echoing that, you know, we um, have a safe safe leave provision in our sick time law that, you know, is most commonly, the most common need for that would be a domestic violence situation. Um, and it's quite broad. Um, we, you know, we frequently, you know, encounter in our enforcement work, you know, em employer policies that don't reference safe leave. And so that that's a frequent issue that we'll bring in and, um, you know, sort of impose a civil penalty and require them to fix their policies so that it includes safe leave so that workers are being informed of that right. Um, but, you know, very rare to get complaints about it. And, you know, it, it's an area where, you know, I think we could do more outreach to generate more complaints. And it's something, you know, we're interested in exploring. Um, you know, we've had one case, um, did media on it to try to kind of, you know, with the workers' permission to try to kind of get the word out about those protections. Um, but where, where a worker was fired um, after her um, abuser uh, filed a false police report against her and she was in jail. And so uh, missed work. And then, you know, really just really troubling how the employer kind of took her abuser's side, you know, in saying, you know, well, you know, she's in jail. She's obviously in the wrong. And, you know, she was, a, a, you know, a, a survivor of abuse. Um, you know, so we did eventually get, you know, get a remedy for her and back pay and, um, you know, it made that employer come into compliance. Um, but, you know, just really for us, I think illustrated how tough, uh, these situations are, you know, not only for us just enforcing the law, but, you know, for the person who sort of is experiencing kind of the double victimization of like their abuser and then their employer taking their side. Thank you. I want to try and squeeze in uh, just one more question. We've had some discussion on the chat and Q&A um, asking about uh, sort of if you all have any thoughts about best practices for enforcement in those states that are still uh, at will jurisdictions that don't have the just cause provisions or aren't quite there yet, do you have any thoughts or uh, quick recommendations there? I mean, I, I would say that, you know, the retaliation protections in the laws and worker whistleblower protections and those kind of things, you know, th those are still really important. You know, like most jurisdictions don't have a just cause law. It's like a new idea. It's a good idea. Um, but but there is a lot um, that agencies can do without those protections um, in terms of proving retaliation um, and, and moving quickly to, to get workers back to work if, or, you know, remedy whatever the retaliation is. Um, you know, so I, so I don't mean to emphasize, you know, a new law at the expense of the very good laws that are already on the books to protect workers. Yeah, I would, I would echo what Liz just said. And also, you know, there, the, depending on where you are, there's different levels. You may have a, you know, a city retaliation law, there may be a state retaliation, retaliation law, and then you have the federal, right? And so normally we're talking about labor standards, wage and hour issues. We may look to U.S. wage and hour at the federal level, but there's also the NLRB and protected conservative activity, which is too often overlooked as a place for a remedy. So if you don't have a city department of labor or the state, you know, retaliation law, 
uh, is really weak. You know, again, it's, it's it's this problem of kind of like navigating this weird web of of what the different protections are, but there are different layers that can be helpful depending on the situation. Yeah, I agree with both of those points. I think the only thing I would add is just from a very practical level, if a worker is experiencing retaliation or is concerned that they might experience retaliation, it's always a good idea to document your protected activity, right? So if you have a conversation over the phone or in person, you know, send a text message, send an email, um, just saying, you know, thanks for talking with me today. As we discussed, I need leave, I need paid sick leave. Um, and, you know, and that way there's not, it's, 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 it'll be easier to prove later the connection or the temporal proximity between, you know, your protected activity and, um, and whatever action is taken against you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, I think that that is just about all of the time that we have, but I want to once again, thank our panelists. Uh, thanks to Jen, Liz, and Sharon for sharing your insights. And thanks to all of you for tuning into this discussion and for your thoughtful questions. Uh, before we close, please note that we'll be posting a link to this recording along with the summary of this conversation and any key resources mentioned on our website at changelabsolutions.org. And as Shaniqua noted earlier, we hope you'll join us for the upcoming sessions in our Equity in Action series. If you missed January's discussion on housing justice, that video is up on the Change Lab website now. We hope you'll continue to join us live for our remaining sessions as well. Up next, we have an incredible panel lined up to talk about rural policymaking, and we'll be sharing more info and the registration link through our email, newsletter, and on our website and social media very soon. And before you go, we'd appreciate it if you took a moment to share your feedback about this session. Zoom will automatically direct you to a brief feedback form when this event ends. So thank you one final time to our panelists, as well as the Change Lab team that supported the session, Maya Hazarika-Watts, Bernard Lim, and Dana Gonzalez. Thank you so much and have a great day.